morning, church. Would you stand to your feet with us this morning? We want to welcome you into this place. We pray that God's presence would make you come alive this morning as we praise and we worship him together. Come on, sing with us.
darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence the enemy, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, your name, cause your name is light, and the shadows can't deny, lights of every says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Yes. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. It would take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The next song we're about to do is called God of Revival. Um, I really, we really feel that God is asking us to wake up, wake up to his presence. Wake up to his love, to his power. That's what pretty much that the awakening, that's what a revival is, awake being awakened to him. But many times there are things that get in the way, just like the, the verse says, that we need to fight, we need to go against what the weapons that God gives us against these strongholds. I started looking up what stronghold is, and it's pretty much anything. It's a place that is being fortified, you know, uh, to stand against an attack. In this case, these strongholds represent our sin. In this case, it represents the things that hold us back from God. God is trying to penetrate into each one of us, but we're, we have this stronghold set up that we don't let him pass through. And I believe that, you know, we're all in the same boat. We're all here. We're all running after God's grace. And I think it's time to let God, to ask God to come and break them, to come and penetrate, to just get completely surrender to Him. It's just amazing what God can do when we do that. And I don't know about you, but I want to fight against the enemy. The enemy keeps doing things. But we're gonna stand strong, we're gonna declare. The Bible says declare the thing, we, we, the way we fight is by declaring the word of God in, in every day of, of our lives. So that's what we're gonna do. Why don't you pray with me, Lord? You have given us the authority to fight. You have given us the authority, you have already won. 
So let us remember that. And when things come, when those struggles start to build up in our hearts and our minds, because that's where the enemy tries to come and attack our minds. In Jesus' name, we ask you, Lord, to help us to fight, to come against all of these things. Lord, to be set free. So we ask you for freedom in this place. We ask you for the power of the Holy Spirit all upon this place. We depend on you, Lord. We want to follow you. So come awaken your people. Come awaken your city. We're here for you, Jesus.
worship the King. Come on, lift up your voice and declare victory against all of those things, against all of the strongholds in Jesus' name. right now take your hands lift them up and just turn them like this turn your palm towards heaven God wants to give you something today open your hands to receive what he has for you today is really short she's really short uh, I love her very much but she's very small and when we bought our house um, in the laundry room they put a, a shelf in there for you know things that you might have above the washer and dryer in the laundry room and uh, my wife had a very difficult time for so many years now that instead of putting the soap on, on top of the shelf she put it on the floor because she's so short and uh, she couldn't, she couldn't access the soap. And so what I did, because I'm a loving husband, is I, is I built some new shelves in the laundry room, some nice, pretty shelves, and I lowered the shelf so that she could put the soap on top of the lowest one and she could have access to it. What I want to tell you today is that many of us go through life and we feel that what God wants to give us is just too far away. 
because of the things that are in our minds and in our hearts, the things that come against us, the darkness that comes against us in our lives, the strongholds, the sins that have been building up against us, it causes us to think that we don't have access to the peace, to the love, to the joy, to the freedom, to the revival that God wants to give us. And I'm here to tell you today that what Jesus did on the cross, what he did is he lowered the shelf. He lowered it. He gives us all access to what he wants for us. God is not far away. His promises are not far away. What he wants to do in your life is not far away. There is a freedom that God promises you. There is a healing that God promises you. There is a new life that God wants you to walk in. And when we surrender to God and declare who he is in our life, when we put our faith in, our, in his promises, when we begin to see him for who he is, man, we can access something different than the world has to offer. We can finally get to the place that God is calling us to, amen. Some of you, you're like this, you're just reaching, but you don't feel like you're ever gonna get there. I'm here to tell you today that Jesus made a way when there was no way. Jesus gives us access. Jesus gives us access. He tore the veil in two. That means that we can access all his promises by faith. So we're going to do this again. And we're going to do it better than we just did it. Amen. Are you with me? Are you with me today? Let's praise God and worship God and say, God, here I am. I declare your praises. Come alive in me. Come alive for what you want to do. Death is overcome. You've already. 
Down for a second, I want to ask you a question. If you look at your life, you look at uh, the present state of your life, if you look at your family, if you look at your kids, your spouse, uh, maybe you look at your singleness, maybe you look at your finances, maybe you look at some strife that has happened, maybe at home with your family, your extended family. Maybe you look at strife and drama and conflict that's happened at work. Uh, maybe you have some uncertainties about what the future holds. You know, that's, that's something that's, that never goes away is uncertainty, right? It's just part of life, right? If you look at all that, you look at your dreams, your hopes, what happens with uncertainty, what happens with life is that when fear sets in about all those things, about what might happen, um, what God offers is peace. We say, would like, would any of, anybody here be willing to say, just lift their hand right where you are, just slip your hand up. We say, Andrew, I need a little peace in my life. Just slip up your hand right there where you are. I need a little peace. Lift your hand. Just you're, you're believing with me, because I'm I'm lifting my hand too. I'm not just an example, right? I'm not just like, hey, first, no, no. I need a little peace in my life too. I need a little peace. Amen. We walk around our in our life so often as if we don't have access to peace. But Jesus, when we surrender our life to Jesus, Jesus comes and enters into our life. That means where we go, he goes. Amen? That means that whatever we face, whatever uncertainties we have in our life, that we have access to peace. Peace is with us. The Bible says that Jesus is the prince of peace. That's his character. That's his nature. And so today we're going to talk about how to access peace, how we can develop peace in our lives and in our homes. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, we invite you into this place, God. For so many here who are facing difficult circumstances in their life, for so many here who are in a struggle, maybe, God, there are some here who are struggling mentally in their minds. Maybe some here are struggling in their hearts. Maybe some here have some hopes and some needs, some requests before you. Maybe there are some here, Father, who are struggling with some addiction, with some sin, with some stronghold in their life. Heavenly Father, today we declare that you are our peace. You are the one that we cling to. You are the one that we run to. You are the one, Heavenly Father, that can give us things that the world can't give us. So today, Heavenly Father, we lean on you, we invite you, we receive, Father, whatever it is that you have to say to us today. We thank you, Father, for your presence in the room today. Yes, we thank you that your presence is made real to us, God, because for, for, for many of us this whole week, it's been without you, but today, Father, we see you. Father, today we recognize who you are in our life. It's been too long for some of us, God, who have been apart from your presence, have been apart from the reality of who you are in our lives, God, who have forgotten and forsaken our relationship with you. But today, Father, we start again because you're the God of second chances. You're the God of third chances, of fifth chances, of hundred chances. You're the God that continually pursues us. Even in spite of us, God, you pursue us. You reach out to us. You love us, God. And Today we declare, God, that we, we will put our confidence in you, that you are our peace, you are our joy, you are our love, God. We love you and we praise you. Can somebody give God a big amen today? Praise God. Praise God. 
Before you're seated, you can be seated. Before you're seated, look to somebody close to you, maybe two, three people, shake their hands and say shalom. Come on, say shalom. Shalom. And all the women of God's house say shalom. And all the men of God's house say shalom. Amen. Welcome to Emmanuel Worship Center. I'm glad you're here today. Um, my name's Andrew, um, and uh, I get the honor of preaching God's word to you today. We're in a series called Bless This Home. This is part three. And um, we're looking at a section of scripture in Matthew chapter 5 where God talks about what it is to be blessed. And, and these blessings are now called, what we call them today, or they're called the Beatitudes. La, uh, the first week, uh, Irving spoke about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Last week, we talked about blessed are those who are pure in heart. And today, I want to talk about peace. When we talk about our homes I think that many of us, and I've been this way too, there's so, so many times in my life when I've looked at my life and I've looked at my family, I've looked at my extended family, and I've, I have had this feeling that maybe this isn't what God intends, that maybe God wants something more for me, not from me, but for me, that God offers something so much greater for my life. Um, God intends for us to have peace, amen? And sometimes we, we don't see everything that, that God wants for us. So many of our families are not characterized by peace. What are they characterized by? Conflict and tension. God has something way better for us. Anyone use a little bit of peace in their family and in their home? Amen, somebody? Come on, come on. I'm, I'm not going to preach alone today. If you would, give me a good amen, a good yes, Andrew, I agree. Somebody needs some peace in their family and in their home. Amen? Man, praise God. Um, so Levi and Jacob, um, Jacob is, a ten, is 10 years old and, and Levi is 5 years old. They have this, you know, 4 to 5 year age gap. And when I watch my kids growing up, I realize uh, the frustration that me and my brother gave to my mom. See, my, my brother and I are about 4 four, three or four years apart. So we kind of have a similar age gap there. And when I see my kids, usually they, they go and they hang out. Uh, they like to fight. They like to play fight. And sometimes that play fighting, you know, turns into bullying and picking on. And Jacob's much bigger than his little brother Levi. And so he jumps on him. He wrestles him. He pretends to be, the, I mean, Jacob can never lose because he's so much bigger and and sometimes Levi cries, you hurt me, and they're fighting, you know, and so I have to go up there and uh, spank them both. No, I'm kidding, I don't spank. Oh, sometimes I do. But I remember when I was little, I would, uh, I would mess with my brother um, because I was, the, I was the baby. Before my sister came along, I was the baby, you know, and uh, I could get away with anything. Any, 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 are there any little brothers or sisters in the room that you knew you were mommy's favorite and you could get away with almost anything? Come on, raise your hand right now if you were like, like I could get away with almost anything. No? That's, that's, I mean, that was me. And so a lot of times I would fight with my brother and uh, he would fight with me. And I mean, off a whim, everything could be fine. And off a whim, I could be in the kitchen next to my brother and I'd grab my brother's arm. And I'd put it over my, my neck like this, and I'd say, ow, ow, ow. And sure enough, my mom, Tommy, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. And I got, got him, got him, got him. Even though he didn't do anything, you know, just, he just, I just put his arm on me to make him think, make my mom think that he was beating me up. But I noticed that for, for, for my family, there is this kind of constant cycle. They go, they, they fight, oh, okay, they, they you know. Say so you're sorry, and they apologize. And then an hour later, they're back at it again. It's this cycle of dysfunction with my kids because my kids don't know any better. But I would submit to you that we as adults are often the same way. Some of us in our homes, we have homes that are in this constant cycle of dysfunction and drama and tension in our life. Sometimes our homes don't look the way that God has intended. 
Maybe the tension comes from mom telling us, our mother-in-law telling us how to raise our kids. Maybe tension comes, you know, that kids are always fighting. They don't get along. Count, count, I'm going to count to I'm going to count to 3. 1. You better you better you better go clean your room. 1. 1. Come on. Go clean your room right now or you're go 1 or you're going to get a spanking. 1. Come on. 1. I'm going to 3. 2. Oh man, now it's really bad. You're going to go clean your room. 2. Go. Two and a half. Go. Go over there. I mean, I, I don't know any more fractions. You better get to, I better get over there because it's over right now. Three. All right, I'm going to go to five now. Like, this is not, we turn our kids into little terrorists, right? Little ultimatums. Go over there or I'm not going to give you your candy. You're throwing a tantrum. I'll give you candy if you stop. What? Maybe you're a teenager. Man, my parents are always controlling. There's tension. They're breathing down my neck. They don't understand me. Maybe there's tension in your home because you're in a blended family. You're trying to raise kids and the exes are involved. That makes it tough. Man, it's so complicated. How can I have peace like this? Maybe you're an adult and still to this day you think about what your mom and dad had, have done or had Uh, or did when you were younger, and to this day, many, many years later, you still can't forgive them for something that happened years ago. There's tension that builds up. It creeps up in our life, this tension. So today I want to talk about this very important beatitude, and I have a tremendous expectation for God to do some healing in our hearts today. Amen? You with me? Praise God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says this. says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And so there was this old Hebrew greeting, that, that greeting this word peace. And in the Hebrew, there was this word. I told you to share it a little while ago. Uh, how many of you go to work and you see the person that you work with and you just go up to them and you say, hey, shalom. Nobody does that. But, but this is a very, very popular greeting in, in, in biblical times. This, was a, this is how... The, the Jews and Israelites would, would um, uh, greet each other. This is, a, this is a great word, shalom. But I want to tell you something. Shalom, it has a, a really interesting definition. The word shalom is not just an expression of the absence of trouble. What it is, it's actually an expression for your highest good. It's an expression for your highest good. Good. That means I don't want you just to not have trouble in your life, but I want good for you. I want good things for your life. I want, I want to see good things happen in your life. Shalom. I think God has good things in store for you. I want you to experience those good things. Shalom. What an expression. Amen. What an expression to say that, to think about that. Hey, peace be with you. Shalom. And just like all of the other Beatitudes, these were countercultural. So when Jesus is making these statements of these who are blessed, he is going against the grain, so to speak. He is going against what the culture has in their hearts and in their minds. What the culture, see, context matters, right? Sometimes we read the Bible and it's like, oh, okay, we've heard that all our lives. Okay, it makes sense. Yeah, that's how we, that's how we should live our lives. Yeah, blessed are those. Yeah, blessed are those who want to hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, blessed are those who want, want to see godly things in their life. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Hey, blessed are those who are pure in heart. All right. And Jesus gets to this one. Blessed are the peacemakers. Well, this is different because the way they grew up was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Somebody gets you, you get them back. And that was the mindset. That was the idea. So when Jesus expresses this, it's like, whoa, this is different. This is not what I grew up with. It's different. See, when Jesus speaks, he speaks to us in a way that motivates us to a higher calling. Amen? It's a different way of doing things. Jesus is saying we're not going to seek revenge. We're not going to seek vengeance. Peace is our priority. We're going to pursue peace in our home. 
Pursue peace in our family. Pursue peace in our relationships. Blessed are those who seek peace. And the truth is, is that many of you have the right to not pursue peace. You have the right to be angry. You have the right to be bitter. You have the right to be offended. You have the right to be hurt. You have the right to put yourself first. But I want to tell you, to put yourself first is to put peace last. It's to put peace last. Jesus is saying, you want to be blessed? You want to be blessed in your life? You're going to have to start thinking differently. You're going to have to start thinking differently when conflict arises in your home and in your family and in your relationships when tension arises with, arises with people that you know very well or even with people you don't know very well, when tension arises even in church with people who are here and you don't like them very much, that when tension and conflict arise to pursue peace, to be a peacemaker. And this is interesting. Jesus said peacemaker, not peacekeeper. You see that? Peace, peacemaker, peacekeeper, those are two different things. A peacekeeper is someone who often will avoid conflict to keep the peace. Oh, I just want to, I just want to keep the peace amongst us. I just want, I just, you'll work around the issue instead of through the issue. All right, I just, it's like, hey, let's just go there. We're just going to put on a happy face and we're just going to get through this. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I know, I know what she said. We're just going to just, just go. I just want to have a happy evening. I don't want anybody. I don't want any trouble. I don't want to fight with anybody. We're just going to go. We're going to do, you know, we're going to eat. We're going to say what we have to say, and then we're going to leave, and we're not going to fight with nobody. I don't want no drama. That's a peacekeeper. A peacemaker is willing, is willing to engage the conflict willing to engage the issue because their hope is peace. Amen? It's different. They embrace conflict, willing to work through the issues. They listen to each other. It's not, it's not just what I want. It's not just what you want, but I'm willing to work with you so that we can come to a resolution, so we can come to some peace in this. We're not just going to go months and months without talking to each other which turns into years and years. This is the key thought for the series, the entire series. You've heard it for two weeks now. We are not just a Christian home. We are a Christ-centered home. And let me just bang this drum for a second. Let me say, what is the difference? Isn't that the same thing? We say christ Christian home, Christ-centered home, I mean, Christian, what, what, I don't understand. You know that more than 65% of Americans today would call themselves a Christian. Just so you know, in 1990, it was well over 85%. The numbers are going down. So 65% of Americans today would call themselves a Christian. And you would have to agree that not 65% of Christians would come from a Christ-centered home. And, and we know this because when there's conflict or hurts or offenses in a culturally Christian home where culturally, ah, we call ourselves a Christians because, well, we're not atheists. I mean, what else is there? Oh, yeah, yeah, my mom went to church. Yeah, we're Christians, sure. When, when, when it's just a, a, a Christian home, when there's offenses or conflict, it's okay to write somebody off. It's perfectly normal. It's okay to take revenge, get them back. It's fine. It's okay to be endlessly bitter, to be selfish, to be angry. It's normal. It's a part. It's a way of life for the culturally Christian home. But for the Christ-centered home, for the Christ-centered home, this is a home that pursues God. This is a home that pursues love. This is a home that makes Christ the foundation of the home. And all of its activities and all of its decisions and everything that it does, this is a family, this is a home that pursues God. 
It's different. It's different. A Christ-centered home embraces biblical values. In marriage, in parenting, in finances, in decision-making, in attending church, a Christ-centered home is more than a Christian home. It's not just a label. It's a way of life. And I just want you to know that just because you make Christ the center of your family, just because you make Christ the center of your home, and you would declare with me today, yeah, Andrew, I want my home to be a Christ-centered home. You know what that doesn't mean, right? doesn't mean you're going to be free of problems. Somebody say amen. Uh Uh-huh doesn't mean that you're going to go through life without difficulty in your family. doesn't mean you're going to have financial heart. You won't have financial hardship. It won't mean that sometimes you might, you know, lose your job. It doesn't mean that you might not ever have somebody in your family sick. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that as Christ is the foundation, we will lean on God. We will lean on his promises. We will put our faith and trust in him. And when there are problems, when there is conflict, when there are issues, I don't go to my reserve of my worldly way of thinking. I don't seek revenge. I don't do things the way normal cultural uh, Americans might do. I'm going to do things differently because Jesus has said to be a peacemaker. Amen. He says you, you want to you be a peacemaker for you are the children of God. You're Christ-centered Family, blessed are the peacemakers. Romans chapter 12 says this. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on how me, what? But they, but they, but he went over But she said, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Peace starts. Who does peace start with? Verse 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Oh, that's good. So what do peacemakers do? I'm going to give you three things. I'm a linear preacher. One, two, three. Go home. Be blessed. Here we go. Number one, what do peacemakers do? They tell the truth in love. Tell the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. It doesn't say to yell the truth in love. Yeah. You always leave your clothes lying around you bleepity bleep beep 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 beep. Ah boo. Oh. Now speak the truth in love. You may be right. You may be right. He does always leave his clothes laying around. <laughs> and the women of God says, No, no, don't, no, don't, don't say, don't say. Just keep it to yourself. It's all right. We're gonna. Come on, we're pursuing peace today, amen? Pursuing peace. To speak the truth in love. How do we do that? That was a couple of things. I want you to know this. When you are ready to be a peacemaker and you're ready to speak the truth in love, here's something that's really important. Timing matters. Timing matters. If you are in the heat of battle... It's probably not a good time to share your truth, to share the reality of the situation. People are frustrated. People are angry. Something has happened. Ah, my heart is beating faster. I'm starting to sweat. I'm about to kill you. Let me, let me just give you some advice here that when you're ready to speak truth and love, Just wait. Just wait a little bit. Maybe wait a few hours. Maybe wait a few days even. 
before you respond. Let some clarity set in, right? Let things simmer down now a little bit, all right? We're going we're gonna to just chill. I'm going to sleep on this a little bit. And then we're going to speak the truth and love in a way that we can be heard. Is this good? Yes? Is this good advice? Speak the truth in love. Timing matters. At the right time, bring your truth. And, and another thing is when we tell the truth in love, you want to confront the issue, not the person. Confront the issue, not the person. Um, so some time back, my wife and I were hanging out with another couple. We had gone to dinner. And we're kind of just, you know, sharing each other's stories. You know, how we got together, some of the things that happened in my, and growing up, and when, you know, uh, we went through some uh, issues before we got married. We weren't together. We were together, and then uh, before we got engaged. And there's a part of my story, is a part of our story that I would share. And uh, so we're there, and we're, we're, you know, we're eating, we're having a good time, and I'm sharing this story. Well, what I didn't realize is in that moment is there was a part of our story that, um, that uh, my wife doesn't like very much. And uh, when, we're, when I was sharing this story, my, my wife, uh, 13 years, amen, hallelujah, praise God. What? About to be 14, 19 years total. Come on, somebody give God praise. Come on. Right. So, so there's this part of our story where she, uh, she doesn't like it. And I remember when I was telling the story, she had gotten up to go to the restroom. Okay, and uh, so I'm there, and I'm just like, hey, 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 this happened, and this happened, hey, 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 hey. and I'm, I'm, I'm a man, so I'm very naive to, to what I'm saying. Uh, naive is a nice word. <laughs> yeah. And so there's a part, and so I, I shared these history and the details, and I didn't realize how hurtful it was to her. So right there. She comes back to the rest, from the restroom, and she comes, and she sits down, and in front of this other couple in the restaurant, she says, why don't you just shut up right now, you stupid idiot? No, she didn't do that. You see, I'm trying to, sh- I'm trying to tell you the difference, okay? That's not what my wife did. But you would, all of you went like, oh, pastora. <laughs> okay, that's not what she did. All right, let me tell you something about my wife. My wife is an introvert. My wife is the, is the type of person who will kind of hold things in, right? She's a she introvert. She thinks inwardly. She doesn't express quickly. So in every time we deal with our family or she deals with me or our kids, you know, she doesn't lash out. She, she kind of takes it in and then she tries to realize what's happening before she, very wise woman, you know, that's why I love her. We're totally different. I'm like, Go say it, say it again. Say it again. You know that's my that's my personality. Uh, she she's not like that, and it's been very helpful. You know, opposites attract, right? <laughs> so she deals with me and the kids, she uh, and our family and our friends. She deals with a lot of patience. I mean, if you're gonna get on her bad side, it's gonna take a while, right? Very long wick. So after hanging out with our friends, laughing and eating, finally we we get in the car to leave. You say our goodbyes, hey, 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 you know, we're, we're leaving. I have no idea what I've said in this conversation. And uh, we start driving home, and she looks over to me. I'm driving. You sorry, no good for nothing. I'm going to tell you. Why would you do that? We're getting a divorce. I'm leaving you. I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you don't even love me anymore. You don't appreciate me. No, she didn't do that either. My wife... You know, after I had settled down, she had calmed down. She was mad. But she never, she never showed me that. She goes, this is what she said. I wrote this down in remembering all this. She said, Andrew, do you understand that as a woman, how much that part of our story hurts me? She didn't say, you are so dumb. You don't know anything, do you? That's attacking the, the person, not the issue, okay? That's, you are so good for nothing. That's the, that's the person, not the issue. 
my wife did, she says, do you understand that this part of, this, our, of our story, it hurts my feelings. When you bring that up, it makes me feel sad. When you bring it up, I don't feel like you value me or you don't see it from my perspective. Have you ever considered how it makes me feel? Have you ever put yourself in my shoes? What, you don't even need no number seven? No, no, no. no. You know what happened in that moment? The whole thing changed. Like in that moment, if she, if, 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 I'm just going to tell you, if you want your spouse to change, you don't do it attacking them. You don't do it calling names. You don't do it by, by bringing up old issues. You attack the issue in a time that is right when the heat is down and you confront the issue. This is this is how it makes me feel. Man, she got my attention. I was on the verge of tears of how she made me feel, of how I began to understand what she was trying to say, what she was trying to make me realize. I heard her. In that moment, I changed. She didn't let me walk all over her. So I, she don't do that. My wife does not let me walk all over her. I don't just have my way. She makes decisions. She tells me how she feels, and I respect her. I honor her. So here are some statements to help you confront the issues. Here's some statements I want you to be thinking about. Maybe some of these will apply to you. When you don't listen to me, I don't feel like you value me. Here's another one. When you raise your voice, I don't feel safe. Here's another one. When you continue to check your phone at the dinner table, I feel like you don't value us. When you lie, even about little things, I have a hard time really trusting you. When you speak ill of me in front of others, I don't feel like you respect me. What we're going to do is we're going to confront the issue in the right time and not the person. Amen? Husbands, honor your wives. Honor them. With your eyes, that means, husbands, you don't go to Hooters for wings. I had a buddy. Hey, yeah, man, we, you like the, ho- the wings from Hooters? Man, I don't go to Hooters, man. What, what's, the pro- what's the big deal? They're just women. Uh, No, because I made a covenant. I told him this. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully upon another woman. I'm not, I'm not, why? I get wings from Buffalo Wild Wings. Okay, I didn't need all of that. I mean, man, everybody's got an opinion. I'm just telling you. Honor your, your wives with your lips, what you say. I know a couple I mean, they brutalize each other with their words, cussing, crazy names, demeaning, demoralizing, abuse at each other. Men, honor your wives with your lips. Gorda is not a good nickname. It's demeaning. Honor your wives with your wallet. Hello. That means that that you're not making purchases behind their back. And all the women said amen. We got to pay the light bill, honey. Oh, man, I just, I just, I just bought, I just, I just bought new rims for my truck. They're on order. They'll be here next week. You what? It's all right. We'll go, we'll go three days without lights. I'll get, you get paid. You know, we get paid. We're going to, we're going to, we'll take care of it. It's all good. No, no. Honor your wives with your time. Quality time is my wife's love language. Quality time. If, if it's been over a year since you've had a date with your, your spouse, shame on you. Take your wife out. Date her. Love her. Spend time with her. Oh, uh, yeah, but it's, we're not just boyfriend and girlfriend no more. I mean, she knows I love her. No, she don't. She don't. 
Well, he put a ring on it. No, no, no. Keep going. You got to keep loving her. Honor your wives with your touch. That means that, that, that if you want to be romantic, you don't go around slapping her butt around the house. You know? Like putting your hands all over the place whenever, however. You honor your wife with a touch. I love my, my children. My children see me. You know, because my kids are watching. I'm just telling you, my kids are watching. I know they're, and you know what my daughter does? She goes, oh, gosh, guys. You know, I go around. I don't just go and, sl- I go, I, I put my hands on her shoulder. Like, hey, I love you, babe. I give her a little kiss. She hugs me in the kitchen while we're having dinner. I give her a little, hey, I love you, babe. Mm-hmm. I honor her with my, with my touch. And my kids, <laughs> stop it, guys. You know why? Because I want this for my kids, too. I want this for my kids. I want, I want my kids to see what a godly marriage looks like. I could ask my daughter right now. You, have you ever seen mommy and daddy call each other bad names yelling at each other? Never happened. It has never happened. It has never happened. I have never lifted my hand towards my wife. I have never called my wife a bad name. I have never dis- disrespected my wife like that because I honor her. I honor her. And God is calling you men to honor your wives, to honor them, to love them, to serve them. With your ears, be a good listener. You don't have to solve all their problems. Just listen. Listen. What do you think? Whatever you decide, I I support you. I support you. I understand. Yeah, I I totally hear you. I can't believe that. Wow, that's crazy. How's, I I mean, what are you thinking? And just listen. Just listen. You want me to go over there? I'll go over there and I'll 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 tell your boss what I really think. You want me to go over there and fix it right now? No, no, no. That's not what she wants. Just listen. Wives, respect your husbands, especially in front of others. Your husband is not a child. Don't treat him like a child. Seriously. 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 Do not treat your husband like a child. Don't malign them. And don't publicly disagree. Don't make fun. Don't undermine them. This is big time. I'm telling you. You want your marriage to have peace? This is good stuff. Even when you're angry or disappointed, confront the issue in the right time. Not in front of others. I tell my my wife and I, we we help other people. And one of the things that always gets brought brought up is how, how a husband and wife will disagree in front of their kids. That's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. If you're going to disagree, disagree in the room. Hey, we need to come to a a conclusion on what we're going to do about how much time the kids are spending on their tablets. I'm not going to say one thing and then you come and say, hey, hey, uh, dad, is it okay if we're on a tablet? Yeah, go ahead. What's what's the problem? No, I told them they couldn't be on it. Well, I didn't know that. Gosh, you never listen. They always go to you. That's why. And now, uh uh-oh. Hey, Dad, is it okay if we go outside? Yeah, me, he'll go out and go outside and play. No, he just took a bath. She doesn't do that. I'm just showing an example. No, we come to, to, to conclusions together. Hey, we're a team. We're on the same team. You're not laying your head down at night with anybody else, okay? That means that it's you two together doing life together. That means that when you're making decisions, you're making decisions together. That means, I mean, there is, your soul is intertwined with this other person for all of eternity, okay? This is a covenant thing that God has established. A marriage is a covenant thing. That means that me, me and my wife are together. We're on the same team. Even if we're in public and I disagree with something she's done, I don't tell her in front of everybody, hey, that was a, why would you do that and everybody sees? I, later on, I keep it to myself. Later on, I say, hey, you know, you did this, and I, I don't know if that was right. And we talk about it. Somebody getting this today? Is anybody? Am I just up here? I don't know, man. Okay, I'm going to, I'm out of time, so I've got to keep going. All right. 
Apologize when you are wrong. Number two, apologize when you're wrong. Here is the, I'm going to show this little video. Here is the wrong way. This is a bad example of an apology, okay? All right. We've had, in the past, we've had our share of tiffs. But I truly believe it's because you misunderstand me. <laughs> I, I am not interested in a relationship of artificial pleasantries and, and phony smiles. You never, ever have to pretend with me. I'm always honest with you, aren't I? <laughs> and if I see something that you desperately need help with, like cooking, <laughs> cleaning, <laughs> the children, <laughs> your hair, <laughs> I, I care so much that I have to say something because I want to help. Oh, honey. You don't have to be worried, dear. I forgive you for today. <laughs> and I'm always here to help. Everybody say bad example. I say bad example. I forgive you. What? 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 what uh, James 5.16 says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. What do you think your relationships would be like that it, when you sinned, you confessed your sin and you prayed for each other? I am truly sorry. And I'm not just sorry, like, when we apologize, we admit to specific actions and attitudes without excuses, right? Not like you tell a kid, hey, go say you're sorry. Sorry! No, no. I'm really sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry I raised my voice. It was wrong. I have no excuse. I need to change. I don't, you don't deserve that. I can do better. Hey, I'm sorry for running late. I should have called and let you know. I should See, there's a difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse is just, hey, you got caught. You feel bad. Repentance is I'm willing to change. I'm willing to do something different than I've done before. I'm going to take this to God and ask him to help me. Will you forgive me? That's a totally different way of apologizing. We're called to be peacemakers. And number three, forgive and let go. Forgive and let go. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has had a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. See, there is a spiritual understanding that we have to come to, a place we have to come to in our spiritual, right? In our spiritual lives, God is at work. And there was this really great scripture that Johnny read earlier during worship where we are not battling against flesh and blood but against principalities. And you have to know that bitterness, wrath, anger, malice towards another person is not a physical problem. It's a spiritual problem. And when we wage war, we don't wage war the, war the way the world does. We do things differently. And so when we, in, when we have these issues, these dramas, these offenses that take place in our life, we have to attack it from a spiritual place, amen? Because the enemy's looking around He's looking to devour. He's looking to eat you up. Bitterness, the Bible says, is like a poisonous root that gets in on the inside of you, and it will eat you up. And unforgiveness settles in in our hearts, and we cannot become what God wants us to become. We cannot keep taking steps forward in our relationship with him when we have these strongholds holding us back, when we have these chains of unforgiveness and bitterness on our lives. God wants to set us free from all these things. Amen? God wants to set us free from the bitterness, from the unforgiveness, from this, this place of, of uh, anger. And I believe that today for many of us, we can encounter healing and forgiveness today. Amen? Do you believe that with me? I mean, it's time for us to forgive and let go and ask God to come in and, and, and become the peacemakers that God is calling us to be. Amen? And I know, I know that for some of you, it's not easy. I know that some of you have been hurt, you've been abused, you've been rejected, you've been betrayed. I know. But there's got to come time, it, got, it has to come time uh, when you get to a place where, where you ask God to spiritually intervene in your heart. 
Amen? When, he got, when you ask God to come in and say, hey, God, I can't do this on my own. I, I mean, you see how deep this wound goes? Only you can help me. And when you begin to see God work in your heart, you'll find a place of freedom. You'll find a place of joy again. You'll find a place of peace in your life again because God is at work in your heart and in your life. Amen? Come on, give God a big hand praise today. You may stand. This is my last point, I, and I, I, I just want you to see this really quick. This is my last point, and if you don't get anything, I just want you to, I just want, uh, let me just say this, let me say it, find, find a way to say this. Uh, it's so crazy that we live in this country, this United States of America, with this Constitution, this Declaration of Independence, when people are always thinking about their rights. And yeah, we have some amazing rights. And what ends up happening so often is that, is that people look to the government to fix their issues, to fix their problems. They look to government to for all kinds of reasons, I, I don't want to get too, too, deep, too deep. But what I want to tell you is that there is a value that we believe in here at this church. That as people who read the word of God and who look to God, I want to tell you that family is a value that we hold very high. That the family identity, who we are as people, is, is brought together by this idea that God is a father. That he is the father to the fatherless. This idea that we are children of his. That means when you think about your family and you think about your home, I just want to tell you this, that family is worth it. The fight that you put up for your family, it is worth it. You being here today to say, I'm fighting for my family, it is a fight that is worth fighting. It is worth it to fight for your family, to declare to the world, to declare to your extended family, to declare to God, to declare to Satan, hey, this family, it is Christ-centered. We're going to do this God's way. We're not going to do it the world's way. The world's way doesn't work. We're going to be a little abnormal in how we function. We're going to seek God. We're going to be peacemakers. We're not just going to just watch things go by and everything and get revenge and be bitter and be angry all the time. No, we're going to fight for peace because our family is worth it. Amen? It's worth it to fight for your family. Right there, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to pray for you right where you are. Just begin to be thinking about your family, your friendships, your home today. I'm just going to ask three questions. Number one, if you look at your family, you have a home, you have some friendships in your life, even if you haven't got started yet, but you're you're thinking about people in your life. You're thinking maybe about your parents, your siblings, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, whoever. And you would say, yes, Andrew, I want to be a peace, peacemaker. I want to seek the highest good. God, make me a peacemaker in my family. If that's you today, just lift your hand right where you are. You want to be a peacemaker. Praise God. I'm going to pray for you in one moment. Number two... If you're here today and you say, man, Andrew, there is a hurt. There is conflict. There is division. Would you pray for my family? There are some wounds and some misunderstandings. There has been some betrayal. But I believe that God is still good, that God is still on the throne. Would you pray for my family today? If that's you, would you just lift your hand right where you are? Praise God. I see your hands. I see your hands. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the sweet name of Jesus. Father, give us the power to do everything possible to live at peace. Heavenly Father, give us the courage to reach out to those who have been, who have been difficult in our lives. 
God, we want to be peacemakers. Help us, Father, to confess our sins. Help us, Father, to seek you. Even when, when things aren't going well, when things are difficult in our life, help us to seek you, to pursue peace in everything that we do. Heavenly Father, we need you more in our lives. We need you more in our families and in our homes, God. The enemy has come. He's come to distract, to destroy. But Lord God, we declare today that our homes are yours. Our families belong to you, God. Our children belong to you. Our marriage, it belongs to you, Heavenly Father. We declare today that we will be obedient to your word and we will make peace. We will make peace in our homes. We will not be the one to harbor unforgiveness. We will not be the one in our family to, to harbor bitterness, Father, but we will seek peace. We will seek forgiveness. We will seek kindness. We will seek love. We will seek unity, God, above all else, because we believe that that is what you intend for us. That is what you want, Heavenly Father. I declare today that there are peacemakers in this house. There are peacemakers in this house. That when we see, Father, conflict, when we see destruction, when we see evil, Father, or, Father, around us, that we will be the ones as believers to step in and make peace in the name of Jesus. Help us, Father, to be a voice of peace, of love, God, in our families and in our homes. You have placed us in the family we are in for a divine reason. It's because you have called us, you have set us apart to be the peacemakers in our homes and in our families. And I praise you, God, for what you are doing and every single person here, God, and every single family, God, where there is division, Father, bring unity. Thank you, Father, for what you are doing. We pray for our families. We pray for our mother. Pray for our father. Pray for our children. Father, we pray for our cousins, Father. We pray for our sisters, our brothers. We pray for those in our extended family. We pray for those, those family members and friends, Father, who are hurting, God. God, you see the heart, Father. You see, Father, what's going on. You have seen the things that have been said, the things that have been done, Father. And God, we're tired, Lord. We're tired of seeing this conflict and this tension continually take hold in our families. Today, we declare your presence, God. We declare, Father, your power, your wondrous works, God, to be invading our families' lives, Heavenly Father. We declare that we put you first, Father. We ask that you bless our families in Jesus' name. Bless those, Father, who have wronged us, God, who have come against us. Bless them, Heavenly Father. Bless them, bless them, bless them, God. I don't have any other words to say, Father. Sometimes it's so hard. All we can say is to bless them, just bless them. Help us, Father, God, to soften our hearts, God, to soften our hearts, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, if... Uh, you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. If you're here today and say, man, Andrew, I don't even...